Good evening and welcome. I am Debbie Walsh, the director of the Center for American Women and Politics, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to our home, the Eagleton Institute of Politics. And I'd also like to introduce you to the director of the Eagleton Institute, Ruth Mandel. Ruth. As many of you know, tonight's program was made possible because the New Jersey State Legislature chose a very special way to honor the memory of one of their own colleagues. In 2000, they established the Senator Winona Lippman Chair in Women's Political Leadership, recognizing a woman who led an extraordinary life dedicated to public service. During her 27 years in the Senate, she quite simply was the voice in the legislature for women, minorities, children, families, low-income people, and people with AIDS. Having helped establish the Commission on Sex Discrimination in the Statutes and then leading it as its chair, she not only uncovered and detailed discrimination in New Jersey's laws, but also helped initiate legislation to eliminate inequality. She tackled tough issues, including employment discrimination, marriage laws, child support, the rights of children, sexual assault, and domestic violence. Senator Littman exemplified the findings of our research at the Center for American Women in Politics, that women make a difference, that it matters to have women in office. For many of the years that she served in the Senate, she was the only female voice there, but that voice never wavered. Always elegant and soft-spoken, yet ever tenacious, she stood up for those with the least access to the political process. There's a brief bio of Senator Littman in your program, and I urge you to learn <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I did it too. I urge you to learn more about this extraordinary woman from the longer version of her bio that's on COP's website. She really was a role model for us all. We are deeply honored that the New Jersey legislature located the Winona Lippman Chair at the Center for American Women and Politics here at Rutgers and that they have renewed support for the chair several times. Starting last year, we were able to expand the influence of this powerful project, underscoring the importance of developing new leaders in the mold of Senator Lippman in three ways. First, inspiring New Jerseyans with distinguished guests as we are doing here tonight. Second, grooming potential office holders by offering Senator Winona Lippman scholarships for Essex County residents to attend Ready to Run, COP's bipartisan program to train New Jersey women to run for office, which has a proven track record of getting women elected. This year, through a diversity initiative supported by the Fund for New Jersey, we once again offered special half-day sessions for Latinas, African American women, and Asian American women. And we know that Senator Littman would have been thrilled to see the hundreds of women of all races and ethnicities who turned out eager to play active roles in New Jersey politics. And finally, Lippmann Chair funds are being used for preparing women to take on political leadership by offering Senator Winona Lippmann scholarships for college women from Essex County to attend New Leadership, New Jersey, uh, in New, New Leadership, New Jersey, COP's award-winning initiative to educate and empower the next generation of our state's women leaders. We are pleased that a New Jersey legislator is here with us this evening, and I'd like to ask her to stand so that we can thank her for this wonderful support. It's Assemblywoman Linda Greenstein. And we hope that you will go back to Trenton and thank your colleagues on our behalf uh, for the support that they have given us for this project. COP has benefited from the guidance of an advisory committee that includes several of Senator Littman's family, friends, and colleagues, and one of the key members of that committee is here with us this evening. That's Kathy Crotty, who is the executive director of the Senate Democrats. 
Kathy was instrumental when we first established um, the initial plans for the Littman Chair, and she has remained tremendously helpful as we continue to work on this project and ensure its success. Kathy, would you please thank you so much for all the help you've given us. Another advisory committee member who has helped in a very special way is Sandra DeGenest, who is a leader in the Newark Public Schools and who is also the niece of Senator Lippman. We are grateful to Sandra for the work she does and how she continues to carry on the legacy of her aunt in Newark. So, Sandra, thank you so much. We have many co-sponsors for this event who have been helpful in getting the word out, and, and as you can see from our turnout, they've done a very good job. If I were to name everybody who has helped us, we'd be here late into the night, but you can find their names in the program, um, and I'd like to thank each of them for their participation. And now, on to the program. We saw a special opportunity this year to focus on a policy area at the heart of Senator Littman's interests one that, frankly, hasn't gotten nearly as much attention as it deserves in this critical election year. That issue is urban policy, what happens in our cities, and how the federal government serves or doesn't serve our vital urban centers. To address this issue, we've brought together what we think is a dynamic duo. Our moderator is someone we've gotten to know only recently at COP, but as she's learned quickly, once we discover that you're terrific on a program, you're apt to hear from us with another <laughs> invitation. Melissa Harris Lacewell is Associate Professor of Politics and African American Studies at Princeton University. She earned her BA in English from Wake Forest University and her PhD in Political Science from Duke, and she is currently a student at Union Theological Seminary quite well-rounded. Her research and teaching are motivated by the political and racial issues of our time. She has written a book, Barbershops, Bibles, and BET, Everyday Talk and Black Political Thought, and has another one in the works for colored girls who've considered politics when being strong wasn't enough. She has taught students from grade school to graduate school, including a recent course on the political meanings of Hurricane Katrina called Disaster, Race, and American Politics, and has been recognized for her commitment to the classroom as a site of democratic deliberation on race. Professor Harris Lacewell's writings have been published in newspapers throughout the country. She has provided expert commentary on U.S. elections, racial issues, religious questions, and gender issues for many television, radio, and print sources, both in the U.S. and around the world. And I recently saw her on Bill Maher, and I'd like to say she can really hold her own <laughs> in a tough situation. Our special guest tonight is an ideal choice for this program, someone who has much in common with Senator Lippmann. She knows a great deal about what America's cities need because she's the mayor of one of the most vibrant, a city with all the excitement, history, richness, and many of the problems that characterize urban life in this country. Sheila Dixon became the 48th mayor of Baltimore in 2007, the first woman ever to lead the nation's 20th largest city. Like Senator Lippmann, Mayor Dixon is a champion of neighborhoods and a pioneer for women and minorities. She won a seat on the Baltimore City Council in 1987 and served there for 12 years. In 1999, she became her city's first African-American woman elected as council president. For 17 years, she was an international trade specialist with the Maryland State Department of Business and Economic Development, a graduate of the Baltimore City Public School System, she has a bachelor's degree from Towson University and a master's degree from Johns Hopkins University. Like Senator Littman, she was a school teacher. Among her numerous awards and honors, Mayor Dixon has been named one of Baltimore's most influential leaders by Baltimore Business Journal. She was recently admitted to the Daily Record's Circle of Excellence for her third selection as one of Maryland's top 100 women. We're delighted to welcome two such distinguished women this evening, and we look forward to a conversation that will begin with them, and then, we hope, expand to include others of you who have questions. 
You each found a note card on your, on your seat. Uh, we're doing things a little differently tonight. We ask that those of you who have questions, write them down and a member of our staff will pick them up later in the program, and Professor Harris Lacewell will select some to add to the discussion. And now, to begin our discussion and our conversation, it is my honor to present Professor Melissa Harris Lacewell. Thank you so much for the very warm welcome. It's lovely to be back at Rutgers. Um, so I'm going to start by going off script right away. <laughs> so I know, uh, I, I promise that the first question is now going to be the second question, but I thought we'd talk a little bit first. Um, you know, I find myself now living in central New Jersey, something that I didn't ever expect would happen to me or that I would choose to do. And probably the, probably the biggest part of that is that I no longer live in a city. I live in a lovely town. I have a great backyard. We have terrific schools. But I no longer live in a city. And in just two years away from Chicago, which is the second city I fell in love with, because Washington, D.C. was the first city that I fell in love with, I'm really missing living in a city. So I thought maybe the first thing that I would just ask you is, why do you love your city? What is it about Baltimore that makes it a unique and special place for you? Well, actually, you describe a particular area that you live in, which is probably a suburb of New Jersey, and e cities have a balance of both. I live in a community where I have a yard, <laughs> and we have lovely schools, but we also <clears throat> are made up of very unique and diverse communities and neighborhoods, and I think that, for me, is what makes cities so special. But also, the cultural institutions, the... Um, people, the attractions, but for me, I think the, the, the significance is <clears throat> really the people, um, the people that have made a commitment to live in an urban city, and particularly in a time where there are a lot of issues that, that we deal with across this country, but also there seems to be a closeness of neighbors, and people tend to protect each other, look out for each other. And I think for me, that's what, which is the driving force and why, <clears throat> first of all, I made a commitment to stay and live in the city, but also to really work for the citizens in Baltimore. Yeah, it's, it's funny. I, I found the same thing living in a city, that I actually knew my neighbors better living in an urban area um, than, in a, than in a less dense population, that I knew everyone who I did business with on a daily basis. And there was kind of this sense of connection and caring. I will say, though, that I keep finding that as a country, we are maybe not caring for our cities. So the, the citizens within the city are caring for each other. But as a country, we keep talking about the importance of voters who are anywhere but in cities. So I guess my first sort of big question is, if it were up to you, if you had not just the US presidency, if you had a magic wand and you could wave it and make any set of, say, five policies or two, what, what would they be? What would sort of your greatest wish be for how we as a country would be making policy about cities? Well, <clears throat> if I had a magic wand, it would probably be probably a list of 10 to 15, okay. but <laughs> I, I will narrow it down to three to five. And I think the first is, and this is something, and I'm going to reflect back to Baltimore and as mayor and working um, as a legislator, what I, which I have focused on, and that is, um, strengthening families and our families have become weak and they have deteriorated and you might ask yourself well why would government want to be in that role but I think we play a significant role and so if we strengthen families within our communities some of the ills that we face the violence and crime the drug addiction the um, homelessness all of those factors poverty unemployment illiteracy, all of those areas can be fixed if we can strengthen families. That's why Baltimore City, through the National League of Cities, we've adopted their platform, strengthening the families. So what the city has done, what we've done, is we have created within all of our agencies a mechanism of going out and working with communities by looking at the beginning of life, which is the most vulnerable area, and taking all of our resources and support 
to support that from the beginning of life to the end of life. So our whole entire platform is focused on that. So that would be the first, to have the kind of resources and support to strengthen that. The city has taken that initiative with our partners and foundations. Secondly, schools. Our schools are in dire need of an infusion of new capital. First, the physical structure of schools, the infrastructure, which is a significant piece, um, but also the kind of capital that will provide for the diversity of our students within schools and the many issues that they face today that as, was, as a child, um, having a nurse in the school was fine. Now we need psychologists, social work, I mean literally in all of our schools. So that would be the second. The third is the infrastructure. Urban cities' infrastructures have deteriorated over the last 30 years. And, and so that would be the third, creating an, an environment that's first of all clean and green, environmentally friendly, or we can create an infrastructure to get people from point A to point B outside of cars, but also the infrastructure of bridges and other factors that contribute to wastewater, water, sewage. All of that plays into having a good and productive city. So those would be the top areas for me. I'm so excited to hear that your third one was um, infrastructure, but you also had this kind of environmental answer that was part of it. Uh, I'm teaching a class this semester. In fact, we just had our last class about four hours ago. Um, and it's a course on environmental justice. And so for our last class, actually, Mayor Doug Palmer from Trenton came and spoke with us. As you may know, Mayor Palmer is also the head of the US Conference of Mayors. So as I introduced him to the class, he is the mayor of all mayors. Uh, and we were talking about exactly this question about cities taking the lead um, on questions of environmental justice, going green, everything from you know, changing the street lights to LEDs, you know, all the way to talking about the siting of toxic waste facilities. But one thing that Mayor Palmer said in that context with my class earlier today is, cities are taking the lead, the federal government is not providing leadership, they're not providing resources, we're having to try to do it. So let's just take just that one. We, we can come back to schools and family too, but just because I'm hyped up about the green issue, what is it that cities need from the federal government or that cities need from community-based organizations or, or that cities need from their citizens to work towards the question of infrastructure and greening our cities? Well, I'll, let me go back to um, focus on um, what we've done in Baltimore. When I became mayor of Baltimore, um, I took a very simple theme, and it was really um, a conversation I had with Mayor Franklin when she said, you can only do a minimum of certain things your first couple years. Don't try to do everything. So the theme has been cleaner, greener, safer, healthier city. That sounds like a lot, though. <laughs> it, it sounds like a lot, but if you incorporate everything else within those categories and you focus within that, it, it sounds like a lot, and it is, but you can get those done. Well, take green. We create a sustainability commission. Uh, we now have within city government, and this commission is made up of business experts as well as community people. And what we've given them the charge is to create a plan for the city of Baltimore that will take the city to, to the next level for the next generations. And so ca tree canopies, we've increased the number of trees in the city over the next 20 years. So we now, through foundations, through the city, this Green Week that we have just went through, Earth Week, Earth Day, we gave out free trees to our citizens and we said, plant the trees on the, your yards, in your neighborhoods, but you help us to take care of those. Mm -hmm. Secondly, recycling. Teaching people about recycling and what that does and have the impact on the environment without trash. Less will go in the landfill. We've started single stream recycling. It's been very successful. I think that's something that you can do in schools, communities, and businesses. Third, uh, very simple, is to create an environment where you develop um, a plan of action for when you do buildings to start thinking green. I went out to Chicago last week. Mayor Daly is a very green mayor yes. for the last 20 years. Well, I took a team out to um, Chicago to look at some of the um, initiatives that Mayor Daly has created, and we've come back, 
And now, moving forward, we're going to have experts within all of our agencies who have some kind of knowledge as relates to green technology as well as the environment. Someone who could either be trained or learn so that they can then go out and work with um, our constituents. So there are a number of things that, that can happen at the local level that I believe um, that we can make and have a greener um, society. At, you know, at the federal level, Mayor, uh, Mayor Palmer, who's the chair of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, there is currently legislation that all of the mayors um, are backing where well, we need to go to our Congress people as well as others to look for extra financial support from them about this effort and hopefully we'll be successful in this um, upcoming year. But, but that's all a part of, of what I think local governments can do and local communities can do is to take some simple actions and build on those. So kind of thinking about, as you sort of pointed out at the very end there, this question of the federal government. We are, after all, in the middle of an election cycle. And um, I, I remember sort of two HUD chairs best. I remember Jack Kemp because I remember my parents telling me that Jack Kemp had been made the chairperson of HUD in order to kill it. That's what, that was the story around my kitchen table was that, um, that this president hated cities. He hated the people that lived in cities and he made Jack Kemp. This is what my parents said. Um, this is, I have a father, you must understand, who even when I was five years old would sign my birthday cards, not love daddy, but the struggle continues, daddy. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> Just who my parents are. <laughs> um, I used to sign my cards, the struggle continues. <laughs> And that's why it's amazing that. to everybody. I love that. I love that. Um, and then I remember Henry Cisneros um, because I remember, uh, it, because I was an intern uh, at HUD during the years when Cisneros was the secretary of HUD. And I remember a very different atmosphere there. And I, and I worked in a situation where I felt like people who were working at HUD loved cities and were working hard to try to um, uh, redistribute um, benefits and, and uh, services to cities. So what can we learn from this presidential administration, the past eight years under George W. Bush, about what we have done right or wrong under this administration in terms of federal policy towards cities? What can we learn from it? That there is no focus or interest or desire to help urban cities, and that's from my perspective. Um, we have had a difficult time with... <laughs> We have had a very difficult time with HUD, with very stringent laws and rules, where to today we have a population of people who are homeless who normally would not be considered homeless. And so many of us mayors have 10-year plans that are put in place now to end homelessness. Part of the focus of, of HUD in putting strict guidelines in place for very vulnerable families, and we go back to strengthening the families, um, the depletion of CBDG money, community money, community development grant funds that were contributed to and given out to communities to help them to sustain themselves through local nonprofit CDCs that help them to come up with creative ways in their, their areas. I mean, I could go on and on and on. Um, you should. <laughs> to, you know, uh, to to really make it difficult, but what it had what it has done, it, it has put a lot of responsibilities on states and local governments to come up with creative methods. And so, the city of Baltimore adopted two um, processes over the last seven years, and that's through pilots and TIFs, tax increment finance, where we use with private developers. The city contributes. Um, a guarantee and allow a tax, the taxes of that guarantee to build over a certain period of years so that they don't have to pay a flat tax fee. The pilot, we would waiver the pilot or taxes for a period of time in order to, to do development. That actually has helped Baltimore to continue to grow even though we're in a recession now. So it's, it's forced us to come up with other creative ways to create additional taxes, um, in areas that we normally don't um, venture into um, to add additional burdens on families that we don't like to have to do, but we are forced to because mandates are put on us 
without the resources. So I'm really looking forward to a president who is not only sensitive, but understands that it's through cities which is going to help us to create a country that's going to be vibrant for the economy, for families, you know, for, for, for the next generation. Okay, so you talk a little bit about homelessness there. And so I want to push a little bit because you were talking about April and the Earth Week that we've just had. April's a big month, right? We um, honored the 40th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. King. And of course, what we know is what happened within a week of the assassination of Dr. King was that LBJ signed the Fair Housing Act. So April is also really the month in which we think very carefully about, and apparently I fly all over the country talking about, fair housing as a central issue of justice and race. And I want to say really urban policy, that this, the question of the current housing crisis around subprime mortgage lending is just laying on top of a set of housing problems that cities have already had. And it is so striking to me that LBJ, when he had an opportunity to honor the death of, of, of King or the legacy of King after his death, signed a housing act, that, that he saw that as central to this notion of building beloved community and moving towards a realization of the vision. So talk to me a little bit about housing, about how this current subprime crisis affects Baltimore and what kinds of things you're thinking about as a mayor and that you see other mayors trying to implement around housing questions. Well, as city council president, um, one of the... Um, areas of focus or strategies as a legislator in order to get the administration, because we have a mayoral control system where the mayor controls the agencies and the legislative body has authority and power through legislation. Um, we had the opportunity, we built a $300 million, we used um, a $300 million bond to build a convention hotel. And with that effort, part of the stipulation was to create a affordable housing fund and so the proceeds from the taxes that we currently get from several of our hotels who have to then repay it back into the UDAG fund, we put that aside to create affordable housing. So what we've done in Baltimore, and I've been working through legislation as well as now implementing it, is for every development where we are subsidizing, if it's through a TIF or a pilot or a um, plan unit development or any type of subsidy where we donate land, we then also create 20%, depending on the project, um, where it has to be affordable housing, workforce housing and affordable housing, so that we can maintain a very mixed community. Um, and so here again, talking about creative ways. Um, with the subprime mortgages and the foreclosures, across the country, it is, it is out of hand. Um, in January of this year, because I finished out a term for a prior mayor because he's governor as city council president, and then I won the general in November, um, my city solicitor, along with an attorney in Washington, D.C., has been tracking communities in Baltimore that we found where there was a surge of foreclosures, particularly African Americans. We currently, and I'll be speaking next week in New York, and I've been doing this tonight on Nightline. You can watch it. That's a Fantastic. little commercial. Um, I am suing Wells Fargo because we have found that Wells Fargo in Baltimore has focused on a specific community, the African American community, and, and is selling certain mortgages with the same income level, the same um, credit record as non-African Americans, but with a higher interest. And uh, we have found um, throughout the city, and it's on our website about the lawsuit, that um, it is beginning to deteriorate some of our neighborhoods even more. And what that means is that if you have a vacant house next to an occupied house, your land um, values deteriorate. It means extra services that we then have to come in, police, fire for, for the vacant properties. And so mayors across this country are beginning to, in many ways, and Mayor Palmer and others have taken a different approach, but they also appreciate the approach that myself and the mayor in Cleveland has taken because he's suing um, countrywide, a meeting with the banks about creating um, pressure on those banks about the, the foreclosure. 
my um, housing department, what we've done is we've created a program along with several nonprofits to provide, first of all, awareness before people get to that point. And then secondly, counseling and um, loans and grants to assist families. But it is the next wave of individuals who have become homeless. Yeah. Um, aside from where we have communities where, where the income levels have changed and it has pushed out people um, into not being able to afford the quality and the, the, the high rents. So it, it is a, a major struggle, but it's interesting because most of the laws that have to be passed or regulations that have to be changed have to happen at your federal level. And of course, I think now we're in the midst of this campaign and you hear a little bit about what's happening. And so again, it's, it's relying on states. We just passed a couple laws at the state level to bring some um, amenities to um, the foreclosures and then we have our efforts at the city level. So speaking of Cleveland, <laughs> the other thing that was going on just about 40 years ago is that we were electing African-American mayors to major cities for the first time. And um, you know, if we think about sort of what was being written at that time and how people were talking about it, it was this great excitement that African-American mayors taking over um, uh, these big cities would engage in these enormous redistributive projects and that the urban poor, particularly the black and brown urban poor, would be made um, much better off by having African-American mayors. But then we have found that in many ways, even as African-Americans were gaining power in the cities like Cleveland and Gary and Detroit, these cities were losing their tax base. Um, they were facing decreasing populations, increasingly mobile capital moving out of these cities. Um, and that these African-American mayors found themselves constrained by a whole set of um, structural issues. Now, 40 years later, if we sort of think about a place like New Jersey, Cory Booker taking over Newark, we have a new generation of black mayors, many more women uh, in this new co cohort, new young people in this cohort. What does it mean to be an African-American mayor today? And how might that look different than it looked 40 years ago to be an African-American mayor? Is it the same challenges? Is there something new? Are the expectations different? <clears throat> I think that the expectations are definitely somewhat different. Um, I think that people look beyond just race now, um, particularly people who have made a commitment to either come back and move, because now there's a surge of people who want to come back to urban cities. They are tired of the commute the 40 minutes, two hours commute. So people are coming back. Um, and, and actually, for Baltimore, it, it was a reverse. In the last 20 years, 80% of those in our census who left the city were African American, middle class. And so, and now we have a surge of the empty nesters mm -hmm. coming back to the city. And so the, now the, the balance is changing. But I think the expectations are different for mayors today. Uh, because of the diversity of communities and because of what the issues that we face. I think Cory Booker, Palmer, every mayor across this country, probably the biggest focus is the violent crime and reducing that. And so in thinking of new ways of yeah. doing that because of the mistrust that's happening in communities and that has been a struggle in the last yeah. 40 years, um, I think our educational systems, which have changed um, because of the many issues that... Um, that we face. And so, and I think as well as maintaining the tax base that you have and continue to build and attract, um, we actually have increased um, population have, and has maintained that. We're at about 686,000. We were a million 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. But we actually have maintained in this um, last census, as well as our income levels are now adjusting. Uh, we're, because of the empty nesters, we're getting higher income. And mm -hmm. so, our budget this year went up 11.4%. Yeah, it, it wasn't a good budget. It was yes. a very fair budget, and it's a tight and lean. But because of the income tax that we get, mm -hmm. it helps to maintain us through this um, recession that we face. Um, so I think the expectation has changed. Um, I think people um, are expecting more from us, um, not just on lip service, but they want to see actions and they want to see results. Um, and I think the challenges today are um, 
more exciting because I think we have more to work with, particularly in working together as mayors across this country through the U.S. Conference of Mayors or when you adopt buddies based on what your agenda is and your initiatives. Um, so I think it's an exciting time for African American mayors and, and particularly um, for women mayors. Um, you know, I um, never thought or believed that I would be a, the mayor of Baltimore. I actually tried to leave Baltimore City um, 20 years ago. <laughs> I, I did. I wanted out of Baltimore. I went to school there. I, you know, applied for a job in Boston, but I, I was destined to be there. So I think um, it's, it's an exciting time, and I think there's a lot of great new ideas and creativity that um, we can generate because of, um, of the diversity and, and what we have to work with. Well, I mean, we are, after all, at Eagleton, and so I want to I push you a little bit more, too, because as exciting as this particular Democratic primary has been with an African-American man and a white woman as our front runners, we're going to have one or the other as the Democratic nominee, it still has this effect of constantly making us think that all the black political leaders are men and all the women political leaders are white. Um, and so much so that it becomes the way that it's talked about in the press, right? The black candidate and the woman candidate. And I'm like, hello, uh, she's a white woman and he's a black man, right? That there are these kind of unnamed right. categories. So I'm wondering as an African-American woman at the intersection of both race and gender, how do you, um, how do you think that that may impact how you are working either as an executive or in your relationships with legislators? What does it mean to be an African-American woman mayor? I think that, you know, initially people tend to um, be somewhat leery whether or not you can fulfill your role and responsibilities. And as some have said, um, and and you, you have to get a sense of who I am as a person as well as my political background being in Baltimore. But the expectations for a woman, I think, uh, are higher and that um, you are watched more and you are in the bubble more than, the, than a white woman or an African-American male. Um, because I hear it all the time based on this transition that I made and then becoming mayor, you know, that there are some, some of the business groups were, have been surprised mm -hmm. at the success and the fact that <laughs> since I've been there, um, that the crime rate in Baltimore and the homicide rate has gone down in, in the last quarter, and now we can add April, um, than it has in 30 years. Um, and that there are other strides that we're making. Um, so I think that's a fact. You know, of course, um, I think I look at it as a way to inspire others to want to get involved and reach their goals and their dreams in life, and particularly um, young people. Um, if I was able to achieve this despite some of the struggles that I've had, um, I think it's a way to encourage others that whatever their goals and dreams are, they can accomplish that. So, you know, I take it one day at a time, and I stay very focused on the mission and the plan, and I try to bring people into um, the agenda to be a part of it. And I, so I try to create a real balance of the citizens and what it reflects in the city to be a part of, of decisions and, and initiatives. So far, um, as since I've been there, I've created three um, committees of people. Um, one is the Blue Ribbon Committee where I brought a very diverse group in to look at our tax rate. We have the highest tax rate in the state. And it was business people, community people. With our environmental initiative, our sustainability group, I brought in a very diverse group of people. Um, and people thought that I really didn't care about the environment. So now they call me Mother Nature. <laughs> That's great. Uh, so, so, so I think when, once you, you bring people in, once they understand, you make your message very clear of what you want to accomplish in that process. Um, I think people then tend to, to, to see you for who you are versus what race you are, what gender you are. So as those cities and mayors didn't have enough to do already in our current administration, three years ago, Hurricane Katrina hits New Orleans, and wipes the city out. And for all of what that seemed to reveal about the failures of our federal government, perhaps the, the individual person who took and has continued to take the most criticism for it, has been Mayor Nagin. 
um, criticism for a failure to plan in terms of disaster, criticism for uh, his behaviors thereafter. So I guess what I'm wondering is, what does it mean also to be a mayor in a post-Katrina era? Um, as you think about sort of all of the things on your menu to do, how does disaster planning, both for natural disasters and also kind of thinking about how that disaster was made worse by these deep social inequities. So both kind of disaster planning on the fire and floods kind of way, but also a broader kind of disaster planning. Well, actually, the planning really started with 9-11 and looking at the whole broad picture, homeland security as well as natural disaster. And so you have to really t take an inventory of what you have and what you don't have. You have to um, role play what could happen and how you're going to address that. And we've done that. And, and I have to give credit to my predecessor because he really initiated because of 9-11. And then we took it to a whole nother level. And so we brought in the hospitals to be a part of this disaster effort. We looked at scenarios with our surrounding counties. If we were flooded or, you know, because that's being by the water, what would impact us? Where would we take um, individuals? And so we've taken a regional approach on that. But on the social aspect of it, I think, you know, we have to begin to provide um, support and educate the larger community about certain safeguards that they have to have. I mean, it's like basic insurance. Um, it's, you know, for your home. It, it's like having a, uh, a kit of materials that you need to keep and maintain in case, even though it might not ever happen. And so you have to constantly push that kind of agenda to your constituents and work with them through, through those efforts um, to maintain that, um, and, as well as to make sure that um, in your most vulnerable communities that they are a part of the process and not left out there. And so we've created a reverse 311 system that we are in the process of implementing. And actually, I can't remember who in New Jersey actually talked to me about it, but where we can constantly be in commu um, communicate with our constituent, no matter what the issue, if it's a flood, if we have to move out this section for any medical reasons, or we can communicate by text, by voicemail, by email, mm -hmm. in order to mobilize people. So we, Baltimore really looked at it back in 911, and, and, and we, every year we tweak, mm -hmm. we meet, and we work and upgrade it um, on a consistent basis. I have a good team through the fire, police, health department, along with the private sector who's helped us to create uh, a plan. Okay, so I have to ask this question because many of my friends were completely thrilled and excited that I was going to get this chance to talk to you tonight. And there was one <laughs> question that kept coming up, and that is the wire. <laughs> I knew that. <laughs> So you got to figure, if you're going to be mayor of Baltimore at any I time, man, this felt like the best time or maybe the worst time to have this job. So I just, because my friends wouldn't accept it if I didn't ask this question, I want to know, one, do you watch The Wire and what do you think about it? But also, for those of us who watch it like some sort of strange, obsessive, compulsive responsibility <laughs> on a daily basis, um, how, what would you tell us about Baltimore that The Wire is getting completely wrong or some element of it that you really love? Well, I did watch The Wire, and um, particularly the last three series, because it really... F oh, you're, oh, you're, you're still, still watching You're still it? it? Okay. Well, the last three series, because I felt that they had a message that we needed to, uh, to um, adhere to, and I think The Wire depicts parts of every city in America. Yeah. Um, am I like... Because I need to clarify something. The mayor at that time, who was running for mayor and became ran for governor, I, he, I guess he was Martin, I don't know. But the, the present city council, which um, supposedly was me, we don't have the same style of politics. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, you know, we don't. We, we, we might dress alike a little bit, but I have a different style. I don't look at the political ramifications of what will happen based on my decision. I look at the, the I look at the what's good for the cause and the person versus how does it benefit me or not. So I think that's where um, Senator um, 
Lipman and I have something in common based on what you do, the quality, so we don't. But Baltimore, actually, people get pleasantly surprised when they come. <laughs> they do. First of all, we have probably the best restaurants than anywhere. Secondly, we, we do. <laughs> Secondly, you know, we have great museums that are wonderful. We have great other amenities, the aquarium, the science center. But we have great neighborhoods, particularly our historic communities. So, so we have so many other wonderful things that um, we have to offer and, and that are attractive. We have great theaters. I mean, our center stage, which is a small theater in Baltimore, that brings a diverse group of, um, of writers. I just learned that people come from all over the country to come there to that theater. So we have a whole host. But I think for me, it's the people. When you come, people are very warm. They're very caring, and they're very giving. So the wire depicts a small fraction of it, but I think it gives a message to, um, and the mayor, the prime mayor, did not. Martin hated the wire. Of course, the, <laughs> the season in, we, we generated, I mean, when you bring films into a city, it helps your economy. Um, but I think what it, for me, it, well, there were lessons to be learned and, hope, and to go back and, and make some corrections in those lessons. So I have one more that I'm going to ask you, and then I'm going to ask the questions of the audience. And the last one I'm going to ask is about the presidential election. I'm not going to ask you to tell us who your candidate is. But well, what, I, what I want you to maybe help us think about is something that's been on my mind a lot as a political scientist. On the one hand, I'm very excited, uh, as much as many people are upset about how long the primary is going on. There's a part of me, with my Democratic partisan hat on, I feel upset about that too. But with my pure, like, American, what's good for democracy, I, I don't think it's a bad thing that people all over the country are getting a chance to weigh in. What I do worry about is that we get so focused about the presidential race that we forget that it's really like dog catcher to Senate that makes most of the policies that fundamentally impact our life on a daily basis. And I worry, I mean, I just wrote another check to my candidate again. And <laughs> I worry about the fact that, you know, by doing that, moving our, our intellectual resources, our political resources, and all of our financial resources at the presidential level, how do we get people to focus on and to think about their assembly race, their mayoral race, their gubernatorial race? Is there, is there something we can do to not ignore what's going on at the presidential level, but also really talk about how American government is infused at these more local levels? Well, I think it's really important that people realize that all politics is local. <laughs> and you have to show people how it relates and affects them. You know, it's like the person who I know who says, well, I pay taxes for schools, et cetera, et cetera, but I don't have any kids in school, so I shouldn't have to pay my taxes in school. So then you have to break it down what the impact has, not now, but that person could be taking care of that person when they end up in a nursing home. Right. So, I mean, when you go to buy bread and milk every day, and so I think we don't do a good job in educating the public and involving them. So something very simple that I, I do consistently, when I was city council president, I created the PAGE program where I had high school students coming in to the city council working with us to see firsthand how we operate. Well, now I have an intern program for high school students. Uh, where I have them with me, with my staff, where they see day-to-day -day, um, shadowing us. You know, when you we're out in communities, you know, I was at a meeting last night, and, of course, the question came up about the high taxes. You know, I had to make it very clear what the impact was, but their involvement in helping us to reduce it. It's not just a matter of me reducing the property tax. It's about them getting involved at the state level. I mean, the illegal gun, I'm a part of a mayor's campaign on illegal guns because that's what's destroying our country. We were in Washington um, lobbying our congressional people. I was in Annapolis before our General Assembly where the House killed all four of our um, common sense, mm -hmm. closed the loop yeah. gun bills, not for people's Second Amendment rights, right, right. but these illegal guns. So I'm taking the message back to my constituent to say, you live in this community, you see the violent crime that's happening, you see people that are dying and being shot all around you. Well, those guns that they have are illegal, and they're buying them right mm -hmm. on the other side of, of um, Baltimore County, and we need to bring an end to it. Now, how do we do it? You've got to get involved. So you've you got to, you know, it's a lot of work. See, part of the secret, and this is no offense to any elected officials in this room, <laughs> 
But part of it is people work hard to get elected, but then when they get elected, they don't work hard. You get into positions, and then I have this title versus how can I be used as a vessel to to be the voice for the people I represent. That's why I got a big, if you were going to ask me about the superdelegates, I have a whole other message on that. <laughs> you know, it's like, I, may, I, I have a feeling there's a superdelegate question in here. But before we get to the superdelegates, um, there are a couple of education questions in here. So I'm going to put them together a little bit. Um, uh, one question is asking what your plans are for the future um, of education of children of Baltimore. Um, and then another is asking about what are the most exciting educational initiatives currently in Baltimore. So what are you doing right right now, and what do you see uh, as the initiative for the future of education in Baltimore? Well, right now, um, because of being an educator for a number of years before changing professions, um, I actually, under the prior administration, when I was city council president, and we had for three years, and we hadn't had it for 20 years, a surplus. And with that surplus, I was able to um, craft and work with various advocate groups to create a children's budget. And what I mean by that is we now have programs that are focused on our young people. Um, we have after school programs. I'm a big um, supporter of community schools where we take services to the school to support families. Um, and so now that I'm mayor, I put that in the budget as a, as a um, part of the general fund, not the surplus. Um, so that those programs can continue because preventive measures are, are important as it relates to education. And this, our school system is not part of city government now. It is actually a partnership between the state and the city, so it has a separate board that runs our <coughs> schools. We lost that authority, but I'm in the process in the next year or so to really evaluate whether or not the school should come back to the city as Washington, D.C., and as New York and other cities. So those are some of the initiatives. The other is, as I said earlier, I'm starting at infancy. Um, because of our um, federal support for Head Start, what we want to do is from home visits, where we're out professionals that are working with vulnerable families, we want to get kids earlier into Head Start, since it's a mandate now across the country that kids start at four-year-olds so that we can start earlier at Head Start. So we have a whole initiative, and I'm going to be creating the Office of Early Childhood in the mayor's office through the help of the Casey Foundation. So that's some of the initiatives that we're working on currently with the schools, <coughs> along with creating a um, sale lease back. Well, we're going to sell. Cities have a lot of properties, garages, you know, buildings. We're going to create a sale lease back where we can build new schools. So the goal is in the next five to ten years to build new schools. The last piece, which is I think is important is other alternatives for families to keep particularly middle class families into the city and that is through charter schools and so we've provided support to our charter schools as well they're public schools but they're very focused schools and and really build on that um, in the future um, moving forward providing the kind of support wraparound serv services that families need because I think the schools really are the focal point in communities. And we really need to engage families to, to, to not just drop your kid off and then go about your business, but to be engaged, involved, but to have those kind of resources there for the family as well. OK, so apparently a lot of people really do want to talk about the presidential election. <laughs> so I'm going to try to ask a few of these questions. You probably um, can answer them better than <laughs> No, I'm not I don't even insider. give you from my no, perspective. No, no. <laughs> so um, there's a couple of questions here that are a little bit about questions of race and gender in the Democratic nominating process and how where we are right now looking forward to one of these candidates becoming the nominee whether by hook or by crook. <laughs> uh, oh, uh, gosh. Um, no, but, but one of these candidates becoming, uh, becoming ultimately the nominee of the party. The only way it could be, <laughs> the only way it could be crook is if the super delegates yeah, right. don't listen right. to the will of the people. Right. So, um, so, so, so um, this question, and, and actually a couple of them are asking, um, all right, so what do we do on the other side of the primary process? Are you in meetings? So one is sort of like, are you in meetings now talking about this? And also, how are members of the Democratic Party thinking about how to 
heal any kind of racial divide, and, and in addition to racial divide, sort of the divide between the very aggressive and excited camps on both sides for their individual candidates? Well, I really think right now the focus is that in most cities, states across this country, that the leadership within those respective areas are focused on their candidates. And I think it's going to come a time, and I think it needs to come sooner than later, where we really strategically make some real hard decisions on what direction we go. Because if not, we're going to lose, because I'm a Democrat, this election. And that's going to hurt, um, I think, all of us for a long time that I don't think people understand and realize the impact. And I, you know, I think Mr. McCain you know, is a nice man, but I just don't think he's the one. So I think that... Um, Putting aside egos and, and candidates, it's like, you know, our governor supported a candidate, and I had supported another candidate, and my candidate won the state of Maryland. <laughs> so the debate is, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, the debate is who's going to lead the state of Maryland to the, um, the convention, convention. Yeah. because Congressman Elijah Cummings' candidate. So, so you know, so the bottom line is, I believe that in Maryland. We as a group need to come together and say, hey, okay, we didn't support each other's candidate, but moving forward, what is it that we need to do to win this in a way that's big? And those conversations need to happen, they haven't. And they I don't haven't think they happened. haven't happened anyway. Okay. But I think that they do, and I think it's mm -hmm. time that it starts because we're not far away from yeah. um, the, the convention. And I'm on the credentials committee, and I agreed to serve uh, um, under Governor Dean, only because, and I'll be honest with you, um, I never thought that I have opportunity to have some real influence. Right. But um, I, you know, I did agree, and I said, you know, I think it would be a good challenge and a good experience. That was my purpose initially. <laughs> it is going to be. Good. Well, yeah, we know now. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so of course, you know, I, th so my position is. In meetings, and I met with the chair of the, the Maryland Democratic Party today when I drove up on the phone, and I said, hey, Mike Cryer, we've got to bring the folks together in Maryland, and maybe we have to lead as example to put aside our differences and strategically make sure we have the best candidate and the Democrat wins. Yeah. So the conversations have started, but, but, I, but I don't think we're there yet. So I know here, everybody who's anywhere near New York City these days um, over the past week is just feeling the intensity of the, the Sean Bell verdict. Uh, and so we do have a question here, and um, you know, it's, it's part of, you know, you talk about wanting to reduce violent crime, but I know that for many in urban communities, they are as worried about the, the forces that are deployed to so-called stop the violent crime as they are about the violent crime, this kind of tension between police departments and the communities that they are meant to be protecting and serving. So in this moment, this difficult moment for so many people who are here near New York, do you have any ideas about how we can change the culture in police departments? How we start to get to a place where we're thinking about protecting and serving rather than policing and... and, and Baltimore um, actually has gone through a transformation in trying to create that kind of environment um, my predecessor's focus was modeled after New York with zero tolerance, and it caused a lot of detention and stress within the African-American community in particular. And, of course, in taking the RAM and becoming um, the mayor, what I began to do was look at different approaches across this country. And I said, you know, we got to change. We can't just lock up people just to lock them up. Um, we've got to go after a very focused group. And so I came up with a three-prong approach. Um, we focus on the most violent offenders. We're engaging communities because the trust between the police and the communities has to be regained. And the way we've been doing that is getting police officers back out visibly in the communities, knowing the residents and the businesses and vice versa, because that's where they get information but getting to know them. So we created Operation Protect, where we go into certain targeted communities. We, we flood with various support services beyond just police. We're, we're forcing, because it's a, it's a culture that you have to reteach your officers instead of going from place to place. 
And so Mike, the commissioner that I selected, has really been doing a good job in changing our police officers in that respect um, by engaging communities, by going out and working with um, residents. And then the partnerships, which are very key, the partnerships between the state's attorney's office, the courts, the federal prosecutors. I mean, right now we have Project Exile, where if you are committing a crime with a gun at the federal level, you get the top number. Well, but the prosecutor, the federal prosecutor, also realizes that you can't lock up everybody. So we're in neighborhoods where we find, where we have take the profile, what resources are in those communities, what resources aren't in those communities. So beyond just the police piece, what do we need to do as a city to, to, to infuse that community, if it's drug addiction and drug treatment that's needed, if it's jobs, if it's, if it's training or education, if it's housing. And so that's why the approach that we're taking is more holistic. And I think that that's the way that you have to balance the two. You have to definitely lock people up who are committing crimes, but you have to also um, provide other alternatives to those constituents to show that that's not the only option that's out there. And, and, and trust is a big factor. I think that the police department, and we have it in Baltimore, um, has to reflect the makeup of your community, but we're, we're not attracting people. And that's why you have to get to young people early to say, if you ever think about becoming a police officer or a firefighter, then there are certain things you can't do as a young person because that will then reflect and affect your chances of getting into the police department. So we're creating police and fire academies in the city, in our public schools, so that we can attract young people to become police officers, particularly African American. Um, so those are some of the things that I think needs to happen. Um, but you know, it, it's right now it's it's very frustrating because the choices that people are making um, to indulge and engage in crime, and it's, and it's drugs and, 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 and legal guns. It's, that's really the two major factors. And the fact that people, because you know, most of this is not police, what they're doing to individuals, it's what individuals are doing to themselves, to each other, in the respects. And that's why these gangs are, are, are growing and, and uh, materializing out of hand. And so creating preventive measures are going to be important. I will say that, I mean, for me, part of the raw pain of the Sean Bell situation is that it seems like this should have been a moment that never happened, even in the context of all of that, that these were black police officers and that this was a young man the night before his wedding. Right? We tell them that if you're respectable and you get married and you do the right thing, I guess maybe someone could say, well, if, had they married before they had the kids, he wouldn't have been at the strip club that night. But... Um, <laughs> But I, there was, I guess part of what is so baffling at this moment is this sense of, well, but here we had black police officers, and here we had an unarmed kid, unarmed young man, who was, I mean, maybe not at church on Sunday, but also not engaging in illegal or... Is there, is there something we're missing about our idea of who our citizens are? I just keep feeling like there's a sense that like a young man like Sean Bell just isn't even, isn't even a citizen, that he's somehow, his death means so little to us. I'm just wondering, we ta started by talking about how cities care for each other, but I wonder if there are some people who are outside of that care, particularly young African-American boys, who I think we see as a menace on our city life instead of as a part of our city life. I mean, it's very clear based on how the, the violence that individuals are committing amongst themselves. I mean police officers today versus 20 years ago live in more fear than ever. So just to sound or to hear about someone having a weapon um, in itself makes a police officer fearful. But I think part of it is, and it, you know, it goes back to the beginning of life. You know, we have a lot of nurturing that has to take place with families and particularly with our children and African male and females. Um, that I think we have just lost sight because they're not our children. And so because they're not ours, it's not my problem until it impacts your family. And I think the whole concept of it takes a village to raise a child in today's society, it literally, it does. And I think the mentoring that's needed, and, uh, and Susan Taylor has this effort going on across the country, and we're buying into that essence care, 
where people are going into the schools, mentoring young people. Um, our Secretary of Juvenile Services, I mean, our Juvenile Service Department is at the state level. He has, is trying to change to uh, eliminate and decrease the number of juveniles in, who are incarcerated. But what he's found is there are a number of those young people who are incarcerated where no one comes to visit them. Their families don't come. So he took it upon himself along with his staff, and they now are, have adopted and are mentoring. Each of them have a young person that they are adopting who has no one to come and visit them to be their mentor. And what we've done um, is my staff, I've challenged them to join with the Secretary of Juvenile Services to adopt a young person whose parents and families don't come to visit them at all. And, and again, it goes back to services and support that I think we lose sight of, and that is mental and psychological support that young people need that maybe you and I didn't need because we had a strong family that are missing today versus just wiping someone off. That's why we're trying to reverse our gang effort. We have Operation Safe Street, um, which is named after ceasefire out of Chicago, where we are engaging folks who are part of that culture to go out, work in that community, to do mediation so that they don't end up killing each other because they can relate to each other better than the police officer. And it's having some success in some parts of the city. So we've talked a lot about legislation and sort of what governments can do. Someone in the audience has asked about churches um, and how there are many, not only churches, but other faith-based um, civil society organizations that want to get involved, that want to make a difference. How do you as a mayor incorporate and think about how to make use of the churches in your, in your city? Actually, we make use of not only the churches, the mosques, and the synagogues. I have a faith-based coordinator, and we are constantly involving all these groups that I've named, that I've created. There's someone from the faith-based community who's a part of that. Um, we're outreaching to them. Part of our um, crime plan, we've engaged the churches where they've made commitments, where their people are trained through... Um, the citizens on patrol, we have pastors on patrol who are going out and working with individuals within their respective communities. So we, we engage our churches and religious groups in, in many ways um, who have, are active. Now we're recruiting many of our religious institutions to work and go into our schools and help them provide support. So there are a number of ways. They participate in the after school programs. So, I mean, it's, you know, we have of course, churches on every corner, right. <laughs> but um, um, but you know we're, we're trying to engage them because they're significant and they, and they don't pay taxes. Right. So I'm not. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So um, this one, in certain ways, um, uh, connects with uh, the the question of green living uh, that we were talking about before, but and and with education, and it's a question about obesity. And the notion that obesity is an epidemic in the U.S. affecting young people um, and that urban centers are potentially a great place for creating walking pathways and, and, and that part of what we do that greens the environment also provides for our own health. I know you were mentioning um, Mayor Daley and I, you know, I often say one of the things I learned in all my years of living in Chicago is that um, you know, corruption is not all bad, uh, which is to say that... <laughs> There's no, there's no doubt there's all kinds of problems in the daily administration, but it's also true that as a cyclist and as a green mayor, um, part of what he's done for at least part of the city is that he's created a you know, fantastic kind of urban landscape where you're right there with the water, with the green. Of course, the problem is that that's only for part of the city and that in so many other parts of the city, they went in and, for example, ripped up the basketball courts and where it's too unsafe to even be outside walking. So how do you as a mayor think about creating these green initiatives that are also good for obesity efforts, but not just for the downtown urbanites, Well, but, but for Actually, everybody? when I was in Chicago, and this is my second trip, <laughs> he created um, um, green spaces within some of the um, areas that had been abandoned, as well as created around schools, made the blacktops greener where if it's a community that's uh, highly senior populated, made walk um, parks, et cetera. So, I mean, I, I thought he did a good balance. I saw a good balance. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually love Chicago as a city for lots of reasons, but it, it is true that if you live in North Lawndale, it is, it's not the same kind of 
outside exercise environment as, say, Lincoln Park. I mean, there are these big right. disparities in neighborhoods. Well, I, I, as an exerciser, I, um, we have great parks in the city, and we now have a big push for people coming out and cycling and really in, engaging in their parks. So we're trying to make our parks not only safer but also friendlier for people to maximize. Uh, when I said greener, cleaner, greener, healthier, safer, right. well, our health commissioner uh, um, started an initiative called Be More Healthy. And I mean, he's really a rock star, too. <laughs> but he, we have a number of initiatives that we've done by leading by example where the city, through its employees, now go out at lunchtime and they walk around in areas in downtown. Matter of fact, they won an award. We um, ended up in the city led this, and New York has done it. I'm not sure Chicago, but uh, we now have smoke-free restaurants and bars, and we just um, initiated the trans fat with our restaurants, and uh, we are um, now working. One of the council persons put together a study about obesity. So we, on a daily basis, we're trying to create the environment um, of people coming out, getting out of their cars, walking and riding, we're getting ready to um, incorporate with the private sector some of the, the health clubs because people can't necessarily afford to, mm -hmm. to provide um, some incentives for, for residents because we also have a very high percentage of heart disease in the city and obesity mm -hmm. and diabetes. Mm -hmm. I mean, for having renowned hospitals, but we have a lot of ills in the city. So there's a big push in that area creating that more. So I'm going to ask the last two questions. Um, one is from the audience, and then one is my, my last question. So the one from the audience actually combines a couple. And it's really, again, it's an Eagleton question, right? It's reflecting on the idea of being a woman office holder. One of the questions was sort of, how does, you know, how does your being an African-American woman impact sort of your running against the political machines, right? How does it make it possible for you to engage in a different kind of politics. And then a question from someone else seemed related to me, which is, what if we could tomorrow shift the entire gender balance of um, you know, everything from the state houses to the US Congress to the Supreme Court? And there would be that many women, the, the number of women that there currently are, um, that would be how many men there are. And the number of men there are, that, that's how many women there would be. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's a fun idea. <laughs> What difference would it make? I mean, in other words, might it make no difference at all? And if it made a difference, how do you think it would make a oh, difference? Oh, I think it would make a tremendous difference. Because I think, I think and, and this is no offense to men, but I think we bring a certain balance and sensitivity and detail to issues. And our fortitude, I think, is we are determined to not give up. I mean, it's like my strategy for the city. I don't think you've ever heard too many men talk about a good balance of a holistic approach where we start at infancy but also deal with violent crime and reduce it. So I think, it's, I think we bring that sensitivity. The city of Baltimore is historically unique compared to anywhere in the country right now. We have four women that run the city. The mayor is a woman, the city council president is a woman, the comptroller is a woman, and the state's attorney is a woman. And that doesn't exist. And the fact that the state's attorney, who, um, you know, in her own way, did not work well with my predecessor, but now she is a part of our whole effort. Now, you know, it could be personalities. I don't know. You know, because she does have a personality. <laughs> but, 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 but I guess for me is, the, let's look at the bigger picture. We have, we have illegal guns. Our state's attorney plays a huge role in how to reduce crime. So she's at the table with us when we strategize with our gun task force and our gun stat that we've created. Um, the controller, which handles certain aspects of, of the city. Um, the, her job is more with audits, and she has one section of real estate. And the city council president, who um, was the floor leader, who's a legislative body. So I think with keeping just looking at that um, sample, I just think that we bring that kind of a sensitivity that can t juggle a lot of things at one time as well, and in a very organized fashion, <laughs> mind you. You know, um, and, and because we've had to um, deal with tough skin, and I, and I don't think that our ego, and, and we women have them just as much as men, but I don't think our ego gets involved as much in trying to deal with serious issues. It's, it's, you know, it's like I testify before the Congress about, and I keep going back to this, 
and, and, and here we are saying common sense, closed loops on these guns. And I hear the response is, well, you know, the National Rifle Association really controls the Congress. And I'm like, what am I doing here? Yeah. You know, so, <laughs> but, um, so I, I just think there's a, a balance that, that we bring. So that's actually exactly the last question that I wanted to ask you. Um, you know, in the introduction, Debbie uh, mentioned that I'm writing a book about African American women and politics. And I'm interested specifically in how black women's interior personal lives impact the kinds of political people that they are and how the world outside of us impacts our interior lives. And so I heard you talking about balance and how good we are at juggling everything. And I saw Karen over here before we got started with her, you know, Blackberry out, making the world work. And um, I guess the, the question that I keep asking African-American women, activists, office holders, everyone that I can get my hands on is, here we are on the one hand doing it all, doing it all while looking perfect and you know, doing it all while um, making it look easy and trying to, as you talked about earlier, set a standard and a role model so that other people can feel that they too can reach their dreams. I just worry about how frequently as black women in particular, as we're sort of setting our role models for our daughters and our, our nieces and our family, we're also telling them that they have to do it all. They have to bear up under everything. They have to handle every part of it. And I keep wondering, is there some way that we could be more sustainable, that we could have a space to not have to solve every problem at the state, the local, the federal level, not have to carry every burden in the household? And so I'm just sort of asking you to let us know something about sort of what that part of your life and your struggle is and how you, you work to create exactly that balance you were just talking about. You know, it's, it, it's, it, they, they're good days and they're bad, and you, and you have to put things in perspective. And I think for me, um, because of just everything that, that I've been through and, um, and, and focusing on and juggling, that, one, I, I have a faith in God that um, really keeps me driven and focused. I also realize that I have to take time and space out for myself. And, you know, and, and that issue's gonna be there. And also have a good team that's gonna be able to help. You know, because it's not just about that person, you have to have a good team. And I think that um, helps you in being able to do it all. I mean, you know, my daughter's now in her first year of college and she's in Manhattan. And, um, you know, I, I say to her, that you know, I want her to reach her goals, but but I also say to her, and she sees you know her mother and her father work very hard. That I want her to stay focused, but I also don't want her to I don't want her to rely on others necessarily to to, to accomplish what she needs to, particularly in the area that she's going in because she's going into fashion, the business area of fashion, and so. Um, so, so I think for me, it, it's, it's having a relationship with God. It's knowing when to step back and saying, hey, you know, I can't figure this out. I, you know, I've, I need help. Um, and, um, and really taking those moments and times. For me, when I'm in the gym, it's, it's, it's my space um, where I just kind of go into myself and people kind of know that. Um, that this is her space, leave her alone. Your constituents leave you alone in the gym? Yeah, they do. <laughs> um, um, or, you know, if I'm home um, and, and my kids know and vice versa. So it's, it's, it's every day you, you learn something different and new to, to try to maintain that. You know, do I, do I don't have a personal life. Um, so it's a lot of sacrifices you make. Um, and, um, and so, and, but the, the reward is being able to see some results or someone you can, who will stop you to say you were helpful in, in, the, in changing their lives. Um, so, so it has its, its plus and minuses, um, but it's something that if you're not committed and focused and, you're, and, you, and you need to center yourself, and I think for me the discipline came because um, after high school, and I'm not going to say when I came out, you can just look it up <laughs> on my bio because then you know my age. But I, I, I met this guy, and during the summer I, I finished high school, and he was into karate. And in order to deal with him, I had to get into karate. I, 
had no intention. Shogun Ru, Okinawa style. Well, I learned karate and I trained for 18 years and I have a second degree black belt. But what that, but, but, but what that did for me, and I tell young people every day, I share, I said, sometimes you can get a relationship and go style, but there's some but good that some comes out. But what came out of that, what came out of it was it made me a dis more disciplined person and I would would definitely, if we could create karate classes in schools today for kids, it made me disciplined. It changed my eating habits. Um, I already worked out and exercised, so that was already part of it, but it did a lot of other things. So I think that also was a piece that helped um, to center me. It, you know, um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of a, the question that you're asking now is, more intimate and personal that uh, if it was an intimate group, I would go into more detail. Because I'm, I'm also a very private person and a shy person, believe it or not. So one to be in politics. Um, but um, so I think you have, to, you have to find that center, you know. Um, and, you know, I meditate. So, I, so there's some things that I try to do. You know, I scream alone and, and I cry, you know, sometimes to myself, you know, um, to release it, you know. But uh, so that's, I'll let y'all in a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, you may be shy and reserved, but you are also brilliant and lovely. And it has been such a joy to come to you. It's, it's, it's my pleasure. I just want to thank the two of you for letting us in on this little conversation that you had here. It was a lot of fun. It was really interesting. And I really do feel like tonight um, we had a chance to honor the legacy of Senator Winona Lippman with the two of you. You really did her honor quite well. And thank you so much for being here. And thank all of you for joining us tonight.